Okay, uh, I'm going to start. Um, so today the goal is to get to uh, the algebraic uh, way to think about uh, entanglement and quantum field theory. Um, and I'm going to start by uh, just sort of going back to what we did before uh, with the path integral and um, doing it in a little bit more detail. So we're interested, we're interested in sort of recovering uh, the thermo field uh, double description uh, of the vacuum. Uh, where we interpret the vacuum as somehow entangled between two regions, uh, and we'll take those two regions to be just half of all space, so we'll be talking about the Rindler case. Um, so we wrote down this picture before, uh, which was meant to compute the path integral, uh, was meant to compute the wave function uh, of the vacuum. So we have some field configuration here. But we'll split that field configuration up into two. So we have phi A complement and phi A. All right, so this is, this is sort of half of all space here. This is x. And remember, this was Euclidean time. Um, and so we interpret that as some overlap uh, of phi A. Well, let me call that four, phi A complement there, phi A with the vacuum. Okay. Um, now, uh, we then, so this is, this is just the standard interpretation for the Euclidean path integral for the vacuum, but then uh, motivated by what we did yesterday, we should think about slicing open the path integral in a different way by picking uh, um, cylindrical coordinates like this. So we have theta going around like this. Um, but in that language, we would interpret this, we interpret this path integral slightly differently. We, we interpret it as a transition amplitude between some field configuration phi A and the field configuration over here. Um, so really what we would draw is something like this. Phi A we would have, say, some ket and some, some bra and then some ket over here. Uh, and then this thing is, is transition amplitude. So phi A uh, times the generator of rotations. Now we're just rotating by pi, or the, really the generator of boosts, uh, but then because it's a Euclidean path integral, we don't have an, an I here. So we get pi times that generator, which I called hc last time, phi a. Uh, and here we have phi a twiddle. Um, and so the question is, these are you know, the same path integral. They're just interpreted differently. So they should give the same number. So these quantities should be equal. Uh, but then we somehow have to relate when we equate these two, we should somehow relate this, this to this. Um, but you can see, you know, you can see that they've been flipped. One, uh, one is a bra, one is a ket. So the only way to relate these states is to use some kind of anti-linear operator. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, in terms of the right, so we need to somehow relate phi a twiddle to phi a complement. Um, now, uh, if you just you know, insert, say, the field operator into the path integral here uh, and here, it's not hard to argue that the field configurations themselves should be related. So you should have some relation like this. Phi a complement evaluated at minus r should be equal to phi a twiddle at r. So remember, r is this direction here. Uh, it's the radial direction for, the, for this path integral. So here's r. Uh, and then we would have x here. Uh, so there's some relation like this for the actual configurations. Um, then uh, if we take this guy, this expression here, and we insert a complete set of 
say, you know, uh, eigenstates of this operator, of the, of the boost operator. So these are Rindler eigenstates. But let's just sort of informally, formally in, insert a complete set of states. Uh, so then we would get that this guy is equal to sum of i e to the minus pi e i phi a phi a twiddle. And then let me just define e i star, uh, which is now in the complement Hilbert space via this relationship. So e i phi a twiddle in a should be equal to phi a complement e i star. Um, this is an a complement. Uh, then so I'm just, I'm just defining this by, via this linear relation, where I'm relating the field configurations in A to the ones in A complement using this relation here. Okay. Um, then if I do that, then I can rewrite this expression as the following. I can rewrite it as, what's that? Yeah, there's no complex conjugate there. Can think about that. Yeah, that's no. Can rewrite it as e to the minus epsilon i uh, phi a epsilon i phi a complement uh, epsilon i star. Um, and now this is beginning to look a little bit more like this. In fact, I can uh, just equate these two here um, and just read off what the wave function of the vacuum is. It's this. And so this is exactly the thermofield double expression that I motivated at the beginning of last lectures, of the last lectures. Um, of course, you know, I've just defined this, these epsilon i stars via this relation, so we still, there's still something that we need to understand. And the thing that I, I'm going to say we need to understand is what is the anti-linear operator that acts on this um, and exchanges these two. Uh, so if we can understand that, then we can understand what this epsilon i is. Um, okay. Let me... Really okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to define a J, which is anti-linear, uh, via this action. So it takes epsilon i, sorry, epsilon i star, in a complement epsilon i, uh, and it switches them epsilon i, and this is J. So we get epsilon j star, a complement epsilon i, a. Um, so via this definition, so this is now anti-unitary. And via this definition, you see that this state is left invariant. Um, you can also, let me... if I can get any of these equations here. Uh, can anyone see these equations? <laughs> um, now, uh, you can also basically argue based on the definition. So this definition of epsilon i star uh, and also this relation here that, in fact, J acts like this on the field operators. So this is, you know, a more complicated calculation that I'm not going to go through. I'll leave as an exercise. Uh, it takes the field operators to the dagger of the field operators and switches x to minus x. Okay, so the x to minus x is already sort of manifest in this equation. 
The dagger is just because these are anti-linear operators. Uh, arises because this is an anti anti-linear operator. Um, and so this is exactly the same uh, action as the CPT action uh, in quantum field theory, although a more refined version is to call it the CRXT transformation, where Rx is the reflection symmetry, uh, where I send x to minus x. Of course, in 2D, there's no distinction between that and parity. Um, however, in higher dimensions, where all these calculations work as well, uh, the rule is to take the entangling surface, which is this cut through half of all space. You have some perpendicular direction I'll call x, and you flip x to minus x, holding the other directions fixed. OK. So uh, the antilinear operator itself is this CPT, or C. CRT. Um, okay. Uh, and that's consistent uh, with the statement that J leaves the vacuum invariant because CPT somehow is, a, is some universal symmetry in any quantum field theory, and I didn't really put anything else into this calculation. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, so now we have our J, um, our anti. Uh, well, now we understand what J is. Um, there's another operator that I'd like to introduce in this language, which is basically I'll call it delta. Um, and what we do is we take the reduced density matrix for the complement region, we take the inverse, and we tensor product with the reduced density matrix for the A region. Um, so this, this operator has the property that um, it leaves invariant the state as well. So uh, delta omega is omega. Um, and you can see that various ways, but uh, one way to see that is to take just the reduced density matrix and act on this state um, and then use the, the form of the thermofield double, which I've hidden here. This form here. Uh, and use that row. Uh, these are eigenstates of row. Uh, so then this is just sum over i, epsilon i. And then I get e to the i s pi a, sorry, pi epsilon i. I star, um, uh, but you know the, the these have the same. Uh, these are these guys are eigenstates of the row a complement operator. So I can rewrite this as just row a complement to the I S acting on the vacuum. Uh, right. So this is just a number, but then I can rewrite that as this operator acting on the vacuum using the fact that row a e to the, I'm missing a 2 pi here, sorry. Also missing a minus sign. Um, so that means that, you know, I can always push the action of the reduced density matrix on the vacuum to the action of the reduced density matrix on the complement region. Uh, and I always get the same thing. And so that means in terms of delta, I can take this expression and I can push this onto the other side and it just cancels this. And so delta acting on, on the vacuum leaves it invariant. Um, now, uh, and in fact, you know, any function of delta, you can also show that any function of delta acting on the vacuum just gets evaluated at one. And you can show that. Um, now, it's useful to figure out what is this delta. So this delta, uh, remember, from the last lecture, we figured out what the reduced density matrix was. We, we figured out a fairly explicit form for the reduced density matrix uh, in terms of the stress tensor. Um, 
So we had, for example, well, delta has two terms now. One, which comes from rho, which is minus 2 pi this uh, boost um, charge. Uh, but then there's another term from the complement, which is 2 pi times the equivalent operator in the complement region, where HC A complement, or A, remember, was just this integral over the stress tensor, T0, 0, from 0 to infinity. And the complement one uh, is just integral dx, 0 to infinity, minus x t0, 0, 0. Sorry, this is from minus infinity to 0. Uh, and the, you know, this minus x is just to make sure this is still a positive number. So remember, this had some interpretation as the effective temperature. Uh, and so this is, you know, the, this is 1 over the effective temperature. So similarly, this, this has that interpretation. And because I'm integrating from minus infinity to infinity, I need a minus sign here. Uh, so when I combine these two, I just get the complete integral over x times t0, 0 from minus infinity to infinity. Yes? Uh, how you can make sure that th this h is uh, finite? Because your integral doesn't look like that. What do you mean they're finite? So they're, they're well-defined operators, you mean? Or? Um, so you're integrating at t0, 0, 0 times x from 0 to infinity. So... Uh, you need some, something like a f nice fall of conditions. Ah, sure. This is an operator statement, right? So, uh, yeah, in certain states, that will f certainly fall off. T0, 0, 0 as a function of x will fall off. So, yeah, th this, this is an operator that's well defined on some states, at least. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, OK. So now, now we take these two, we combine them together, and we get this form for delta. Uh, which is, which I write like this, minus k hat. k hat is sometimes called the full modular Hamiltonian. It combines terms, uh, I think I used this language before, but this you might call the modular Hamiltonian, k a. Uh, and then if you combine k a, and this you might call k a complement, uh, and if you combine the two Ka with Ka complement, then you get the full modular Hamiltonian. Um, and together, in this case, you just get an integral from minus infinity to infinity, t0, 0, which is then just literally the, the charge associated to the boost symmetry. So it's really integral over a complete Cauchy slice, t mu nu, c mu, t sigma nu. Um, so it's this object that's really the boost generator. The other object, this guy is really sort of half the boost generator. Um, so then, you know, this statement, for example, delta, you know, leaving invariant, the, the vacuum becomes obvious because the vacuum is boost invariant. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and so just to summarize, what we've learned is that these sort of quantum information objects that we defined, these density matrices, and then we can define this delta out of these density matrices, have very nice geometric interpretations. And if we also include J in that discussion, then we get this picture. So here is the Rindlow edge. Oh, sorry, here is Minkowski space. Here's the Rindlow edge. Um, here's A. And... Um, Firstly, you know, if I have an operator over here, I can act with these deltas on that operator. And I get some other operator at some other location, and they're related to each other via a boost. So that's some kind of boost. There's some trajectory like this. Um, and then the other thing I can do is I can take J and act on some operator. And then I'll get uh, another operator, J dagger. Uh, and if I write T and X here, 
because this is the CPT operation, it flips T and X. And so I get an operator over here. So that's the J operation. This is the delta to the IS operation. Okay, so in particular, you notice the, the J operator, which you know, we defined to flip uh, the two uh, energy eigenstates, the, uh, sorry, the two modular energy eigenstates. Um, so it, what it does is its action is it flips the operator from the A region to an operator in the complement region. Okay. Um, okay. Good. So this switches the Rindler wedges. Where this is somehow the wedge associated to A, and this is the wedge associated to A complement. Um, and so, you know, this works, and it also works for all of the other cases that I listed before, where you have this quote unquote local modular Hamiltonian, or, you know, local expression for the reduced density matrix. Then you always have this geometric interpretation of the reduced density matrix of these deltas, and you can construct these deltas and these j's in those cases. Um, so the deltas and j's are really important objects. Uh, and actually, they arise very naturally in a more systematic, axiomatic approach to this problem. Um, and really, what you should think, or this is the way that I think about them, is that they're, they're what replaces the reduced density matrix when you're not allowed to talk about the reduced density matrix anymore. So delta is what replaces that. Uh, delta and J, really. Um, question. Sorry? Delta and J? Uh, they satisfy this relation. J, which means that the, the, they do the modular action commutes because this is anti This is an anti-linear operator, so that is true. Um, yeah, you can check that again here. Um, so uh, th these are called they're called modular operators. Uh, uh, and they, they, you know, they're studied in, in, the theory, in, in modular theory. And so we're going to get to that. Uh, and the way that we're going to get to that is we're going to go back and think a little bit more about the algebraic approach to this problem. Okay. So any questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. So just to summarize, we've uh, um, you know, pushed the path integral approach to its extreme. We've come out with these nice operators, delta and j, and those are the ones that we're going to reproduce in the algebraic approach. OK. So um, all right, so, so the idea uh, is, is to study um, OK, so the algebraic approach. So the idea is instead of to think about you know Hilbert spaces and sub sub Hilbert spaces and so forth uh, and tensor factorizations, uh, we think about um, space time regions, so causally complete regions. For example, the domain of dependence of some interval d of a, uh, and we try to think about all possible operators that could exist in that region. And we think about that in some uh, uh, mathematical sense as an algebra of operators. So this is some wedge region I'll call W. And to that, there's a set of operators that somehow act in here. OK. Um, so this is some uh, algebra of operators. And then you know, we can sort of come up with some axioms associated to that algebra. Uh, so we sort of expect it to be, well, it's an algebra, so it should be closed under addition, uh, multiplication. Uh, we, we should be able to include the Hermitian conjugate. Um, and all of these things are still in the algebra. Um, in fact, uh, there's sort of uh, some technical things that you can 
some more, there's, a, there's a list of more requirements that you can demand that makes this into something called a von Neumann algebra. And really, the, the, that uh, is related to just how you treat limits of these operators. So if you have a, uh, a series of operators, um, how should you, you know, and, and there's some sense in which that limits to some other oper operator, do you include that in the algebra or not? Uh, and there's some sort of nice structure that arises uh, uh, when, you, when you include something called weak limits uh, that gives you this von Neumann algebra. Um, but this, this is some technical thing. The, the, the one uh, other thing that is required of this algebra to make sense of it that I will emphasize is that these operators, and this sort of, um, is annoying, this is really annoying, uh, but you should confront it, I guess. These, these operators are bounded. To really make sense of an algebra like this, it, it needs to be bounded operators. And so, you know, what is a bounded operator? Uh, so O, um, the norm of the operator should be less than infinity. And if you like, if O is omission, uh, then the norm of the operator is just the maximum eigenvalue. So the eigenvalue should be less than infinity. Um, or, you know, yeah, uh, let me leave it there. Um, and so these O's are really not the kinds of operators that you're used to talking about in quantum field theory using other approaches to quantum field theory. Um, so there's two problems. So a local operator, let's just take a scalar field, phi of x. Uh, there's two problems with that operator. Firstly, it's not really an operator. It's a well, it's not an operator in the usual sense. It's a distributional valued operator, which just means I have to smear it. That's OK. So I can still smear it in this region, let's say in W against some function. And I'll call that phi f. So that's still, that's, that's not so bad. Um, but of course, it's not a bounded operator, right? So you know, the field, the field operator of, of a scalar field theory is a little bit like the x in a harmonic oscillator. And the x in a harmonic oscillator is not a bounded operator. It can take values from minus infinity to infinity. So uh, it, you know, it can have, um, uh, yeah. So it's certainly not bounded. And so phi f is certainly not a bounded operator. Uh, and so you can deal with that in, in various ways. You can exponentiate it, e to the phi f, for example. If phi is Hermitian, then this is a unitary operator. Uh, and unitary operators always have norm 1. So that's a bounded operator. Um, that's one thing you can do. You can do other things. You can project in the spectrum of, the op of this op spectral decomposition of this operator. Um, but, you know, in general, it's just sort of annoying because these are the operators that you're interested in, uh, but they don't really, they're not really covered by this axiomatic approach, or it's harder to get at them. Yeah. Is it clear that the exponential makes sense in general? Um, don't you have to worry about coincident singularities? And... Uh, uh, not, not with the smearing. So the idea is that the smearing will take care of any coincident singularities, yeah. Because those are related to the fact that it's distributional valued. Um, so yeah, I think you can, you can make sense of that. Um, yeah. So, so uh, th this, uh, this is annoying. And I'm kind of, in some sense, going to ignore it. Uh, it's not clear how you know, really important it is. But for me, you know, I'll take some of these operators sometimes to be a local operator. Uh, But you should, some, you should be aware that this is going on. Um, now, uh, um, um, OK, so now what we do is we say this is some algebra of operators. In fact, it's a, it's a subalgebra. A subalgebra 
of all the operators we might care about, which is sort of all the operators in the quantum field theory. Uh, and I'll, ta I'll take those to be bounded operators. Um, so those are bounded. It's a sub-operator algebra of bounded operators on the quantum field theory Hilbert space. OK. Uh, and to each, all of these regions, so we might have some other causal regions out here. We might have some more complicated regions. We should have some subalgebra like this. Um, uh, there's another algebra that's important, which is called the commutant. Uh, and these are all the operators that commute with AW. So all possible operators that commute. So you can sort of give a, a heuristic picture of what this is. So given uh, some region, let's take the Rindler wedge, AW, then the, all the operators that commute with operators here should somehow be all the operators in the complement wedge. So that's AW prime. Uh, if we had you know, this smaller region, causal region, AW, then AW prime should somehow be this all the operators associated to this region. Um, so this is, you know, this is kind of how we talk about the complement region in this language. Before, we, I, you know, I pretended like there was a Hilbert space here and a Hilbert space here, and there was some tensor factorization, A, C, A. Um, but here, I'm just going to talk about algebra's operators and the commutants as like the complement region. Um, okay, um, but an important point, uh, which is really why I'm talking about this to begin with, is that it turns out you can show rigorously uh, that the um, algebra of operators for one of these regions, these causally complete regions, is not equal to or isomorphic to an algebra of operators on some Hilbert space. So there's no way to associate a Hilbert space to this algebra. And that's sort of the origin of the problem. Um, the uh, technical statement, uh, which you'll hear, so I'll say it just so you understand the word, you've heard the words before, but I won't explain it, is that AW, you can show, uh, contains uh, factors which are sort of the building blocks of these algebras, of von Neumann algebras. Uh, and you can classify these building blocks. Uh, and you find that in quantum field theory, in the classification, they're type 3, 1. Uh, and those are certainly algebras that you can't get from bounded operators on Hilbert space. Um, yes? Can, can you say what those factors look like in QFT that lets you say that they're there? Sorry, say, say can, again. Can you ha, give an ha, example of what that means, what that looks like? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, this, it's the algebra, it is these algebras. There's a lot of work that went into showing this. Um, the, roughly speaking, uh, you, can, you can understand this in terms of the spectrum of the modular Hamiltonian, of the, this modular operator, and whether it's continuous or not. Uh, and, and, and based on that, you can you can infer what type of algebra it is. Yeah. Actually, maybe one more intuitive way of thinking about it. It's related to the infinite entanglement between the states on the two side, the two Rindler right. regions. That's right. And yeah. That infinite entanglement is what exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Tells so, you you don't have a product Hilbert space. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah yeah. It's related to the UV divergence of entanglement. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know. Um, uh, another, well, yeah, yeah, okay. I can say some other words offline, so they're not recorded. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Excuse okay. me, a quick question. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm wondering what would happen if your operators are sort of Grassmannian, so they anti. I mean, yeah, uh, right. So your space is divided in terms of something like uh, AW and AW dot when they are anti commutant. So 
Uh, yeah, you can deal with that. Uh, you can deal with that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you exactly double the algebra, but yeah, you have some grading on the algebra, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah there's certainly a way to put fermions into this. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Means that it's not uh, worked out that right now, or oh yeah, it ha it has been worked out. Yes, yes, it has. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I will ask you later. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can point you to to a reference. Um, so uh, good. Um, now, uh, okay. So now I've introduced these algebras. How do we get these modular operators from this approach? Um, so the idea is that um, uh, we can think about states now. Let's think about states. Uh, and I'm still going to use this language, so I, I have some for me, I have some state in the Hilbert space, uh, in the quantum field theory Hilbert space, and let's think about the vacuum. Uh, and the vacuum turns out to have a very special property, um, which is a way of stating that it's highly entangled in this language. Um, uh, and that's the property that, um, it, it's the property that if I take uh, some region, some wedge algebra, some algebra, uh, and if I take any operator in that algebra, um, then uh, if I, uh, if it, it, you could, it has the property that if, if there's an operator that acts from this algebra on the vacuum and gives you zero, then that operator has to be identically zero. Um, this is the separating property. It's called separating. Um, and it has, this is one, and two. The other statement is that uh, if I think about all of the states that I get in this way, where O comes from this algebra, this subalgebra, uh, then this is uh, dense in the Hilbert space, in the full quantum field theory Hilbert space. So that means to arbitrarily good approximation, I can get any state in the Hilbert space just by acting with operators in this subregion. Okay, and this is called the cyclic property. So the vacuum, the lingo is that the, the vacuum is cyclic and separating, and that's these two statements. Um, and so why does that have anything to do with entanglement? Uh, sorry, firstly, I should say uh, this is not obvious. It's not at all obvious. Um, it, it does express the fact that the vacuum is highly entangled between these regions. But, you know, for, the, for this region, uh, let's take this to be W and its complement region. Um, and it's, the proof of it is due to riesz leader. Um, and it comes from essentially analyticity of correlation functions in the vacuum. Uh, so you can show that analyticity, the things that, that David has been talking about uh, of correlations in the vacuum are, are enough to show that, uh, for example, that you, know, you can generate all states or to good, arbitrarily good approximation in the quantum field theory Hilbert space. Uh, and I don't have time to go through that. Um, but that is true. Um, and the reason it's related, or one intuition, by the way, that, you know, how it's related to entanglement is that I can think about these statements for a much simpler setting, which is when I have this tensor product and a complement. Uh, and these two statements, then you can just try to sit down and solve what they are. Let's say these are finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Um, and they tell you something about the density matrix. They're equivalent to the statement that row A, and let's take these to be the same dimension. So these Hilbert spaces have the same dimension. Uh, 
It's equivalent to the statement that row A and thus row A complement have full rank. That means that all of the PIs, if I diagonalize, diagonalize this, the spectrum of the density matrix, all of the PIs are non-zero. Right, so it's like the most entangled you can be. Uh, you, know, you might say that a completely mixed state is the most entangled, but to some extent, yeah, this, this is not another definition of highly entangled. All of the eigenvalues of the density matrix are non-zero. Um, um, sorry, one question. Yeah. Uh, yesterday we said that in general we, can, we can't split the Hilbert space like that. Yeah. So if you, how, I mean, here it, it seems that you are using that in order to prove no, 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 sorry, sorry. The, the proof of this uh, uh, is independent of this. This is two different comments. <laughs> the proof relies on studying correlation functions of you know, uh, local operators uh, acting on I I I in the vacuum. And they have some nice analyticity properties that allow you to basically show that uh, you can get anything with those states, with, 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 with acting with these operators. Um, now, I just wanted to motivate the fact that this is related to the fact that the, the vacuum is highly entangled. Uh, and so in, you can also study this problem, not in quantum field theory, but in just a simple quantum mechanical setting. Uh, and these two conditions are equivalent to this statement, which is just some statement about the density matrix. And so you know, inferring from this, it, it's telling me something about the density matrix, although it doesn't really exist here. Um, so, uh, okay. So with with this, um, with these two properties, I can I can run modular theory. So. Um, so the idea is that. Uh, I'm going to define an operator, which I call S. And this operator depends on several things. It depends on the state, which is going to be the vacuum. And it depends on the algebra, which I'll just to be, take to be one of these wedge algebras, uh, or this, this, uh, one of these causal regions. Um, and I'll just call this S. So it, you should always remember that it depends on two things, the algebra and the state. But I'll just call it S. And S is defined by the following equation. So it's defined by how it acts on all states in the Hilbert space. So let me take, or a large number of states in the Hilbert space. Um, so let me take alpha to be in the algebra, this thing here. Uh, and this is for all alpha. So remember, uh, by this cyclic property, these are, you know, dense. So this is a lot. This is almost all states in the Hilbert space. This is dense in the Hilbert space. Uh, so I'm defining S on this dense set of states in the Hilbert space to give me this. So it's just alpha dagger acting on the same thing. Uh, so you know that defines this operator. It's not obvious that it actually defines this operator because it's only on a dense set of states. Um, but at least it's not inconsistent. So for example, if we didn't have this separating property, then it could be that this vanished and this didn't vanish, and then that would be inconsistent with the linearity of this operator. Uh, so that, that gets rid of that problem. Um, but this uh, defines S. Um, again, there's some technical statements that I'm not going into. Uh, related to the fact that it only defines it on a dense set, and then you have to close it. Um, now, um, this S is called the Tamita operator. Um, and uh, it has various properties. It's anti-linear. You can see that because of the alpha dagger here. Um, it's unbounded. Uh, you can see that in various ways, but that basically means that it's very, it's difficult to deal with. Uh, and uh, S squared is one, for example. 
that's obvious, because if I apply this relation twice, I get back to myself. So S squared is 1. Um, uh, and it also means that S is invertible. So you can invert this operator. And that means that I can define its polar decomposition. So it's an anti-linear operator. That means I can re rewrite it in terms of a positive permission operator multiplying an anti-unitary operator. And those operators are S, J, and delta to the 1 half. So these are going to be the same J and deltas that I defined before. Uh, so it's invertible. So you can take S and you can extract from it a J and a delta, um, where J is anti-unitary. And it also has the property that it squares to 1. Um, and delta is positive, uh, emission and positive. Um, OK. So um, I claim that uh, in the case where the, re the algebra is associated to the Rindler wedge, uh, and my state is, the, again, the vacuum, which is, has this cyclic and separating property, then these two operators are the same as what I defined before. So J is the CPT operation, and delta is related to the boost operator. Okay. Um, so what's the evidence for this? Uh, so... Let me just present some evidence. I'm not going to prove it to you. Um, but the first thing to do is so A. Uh, we can run this again, not for quantum field theory, but just for a quantum mechanical system. Uh, run through the machinery for a tensor factorization like this uh, with a with, reduced, with a state that has reduced density matrices that have full rank. Uh, then you go through that, and it's a somewhat simple, simple but you know, um, tedious exercise. Uh, you find that your modular operator is exactly this. Okay. So um, this is how I defined delta before in the context of the uh, sort of path integral approach to the Rindler problem. Now, um, this also tells us, you know, th this is exactly how delta is related to the density matrices. Uh, and this is, you know, explains my comment before to say that, you know, these operators are somehow replacing the density matrix. Um, uh, Sorry, one yeah. question. Uh, if this Tomita operator is unbounded, how do you know that acting in any operator in your algebra of bounded operator, it doesn't get you out of the algebra? Uh, it doesn't take you, th this is a great question. So in, in general, uh, yeah, it's, it's not in the algebra because it's unbounded, that's for sure. Um, uh, there's an action called modular flow, uh, which actually leaves you inside the algebra, and that's a very highly non-trivial statement. It takes a lot to prove. Uh, but I'll, expl I'll explain what that is, yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, it, it's non-trivial. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you can also see that this, this operator is really, in this context, is something that acts on both of the factors. So it's really something that acts on the full quantum field theory Hilbert space. So it's not obvious that it's doing just something on the wedge. But uh, the flowed version will just do something on the wedge. Um, OK. So this is the first piece of evidence. Uh, the, the second is some geometric argument, which, uh, which is, you know, um, let's try to understand this relation. So, so S, um, let, let me just write it out again. And now I'm going to be, I'm going to take some liberties and apply this equation to a, a one, an operator that's not bounded and so forth. Uh, let's just assume that it still works for this operator. Um, and then we take our wedge region and 
we apply these two operators. So S, remember, is just J delta to the one half. So uh, here's my wedge region. Here's my operator. Let's say, uh, yeah, O A of X. Let's just call it O of X. Um, so what I can do is I can use the fact that delta annihilates the vacuum to add a delta to the minus one half here. And I can also, or it leaves invariant the vacuum. I can also add a j here, because j also leaves invariant the vacuum. So all I'm doing is sort of conjugating this operator by various things. So delta to the one half, ox, delta to the minus one half. What is that? Well, it looks a little bit like, well, let me write it out in terms of the generator of the symmetry that I wrote before. So what it is, is a wick rotation of a boost, uh, which is then just a rotation. And it's a rotation by pi. So I get a Euclidean rotation by pi. And so if this is my Rindler wedge, I can think of this is real time, and I can think of Euclidean time as somehow coming out of the board, so I'll try to draw it like that. Like that. Um, and, you know, boosts go like this, but rotations go like this, and a pi rotation will take this operator over here. Somehow over here. Um, but then J, what does J do? J is the CPT operation. Uh, and it just takes you, reflects back. So that's J. So this is delta to the one half. This is J. Uh, and so you see, we get back to the same operator by doing these two things twice. And that's what this equation is telling us. Um, the only thing is the extra dagger, but that comes about because this is an anti-linear operator. So J actually bring, brings you back to O dagger here. Um, uh, now, it's, it is super important that this equation is an equation that's only true acting on the vacuum. Otherwise, I couldn't really have rotated this operator like this. Because in other, you know, if I had, for example, if I acted on some other uh, state, uh, and, you know, you can get other states by acting with operators in Euclidean, uh, then I wouldn't have been able to rotate this operator through that. I would have had some issue with with this, so it's only true, so it's only true uh, as an equation acting on the vacuum. Um, okay. Uh, so let me write that because that's important. You know, J is something that always, you know, it's a reflection that always gives you an operator in the other region. But rotating by pi only gives you an operator in the other region uh, with, after acting on the vacuum. Um, okay. Uh, are there any questions about that? Sorry, say it again? It doesn't have to be a vacuum. That's correct, yeah. Um, and so you might be asking, I could pick a state like that. Yeah. Uh, so then I don't have this geometric picture, and then it's just, okay, something happens. Um, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm talking about the case here where this is the vacuum and this is a rotation. And you just have to be ca careful by what you mean by this equation. But yeah, uh, r roughly speaking, all this is saying is that this operator is rotating by pi and then reflecting back, and you get back to yourself. Um, okay. um, sorry, the, uh, this expression for the Tomita operator in which you have delta yeah. um, is valid also in the case in which your uh, modular Hamiltonian is not local. Yeah. I mean, it's, general, it's valid in general for any mm -hmm. arbitrary modular Hamiltonian that's that right. you can find. That's correct, yeah. So, you know, as I said, it's something that's replacing the reduced density matrix, and that's something we can define or we can think we can, you know, heuristically define for arbitrary regions in quantum field theory. Uh, it it's only takes very simple and geometric forms for certain regions. Okay. But this machinery works for all of them. Uh, and it works for other states as well. 
Uh, and one important point is that you know, the vacuum is not the only state that's cyclic and separating. There are many other states that are cyclic and separating. Um, uh, in fact, you can take any state and you can approximate it by a state that's cyclic and separating to arbitrarily good accuracy. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so um, the, the final thing that I should mention is this modular flow that I've alluded to before. Uh, Okay, so mod modular flow uh, is where I take this delta operator and I conjugate by some, by delta to the is, some operator in A. So alpha is in the algebra. Um, and if I conjugate like this, the statement is that this is still in the algebra when S is real. Uh, and this is a really just a highly non-trivial thing. Now, you know, it's completely obvious in terms of density matrices. Why is that? Because delta is rho A complement to the minus IS, rho A to the IS. I have some operator alpha, but that operator is really only in A. Rho A complement to the IS. Uh, everything, these two things commute with over here and they cancel each other, and then I'm just left with some operator which is clearly just in A, okay? So all the, the complement stuff is canceled out. Uh, but, you know, proving this in general is a non-trivial statement. And, you know, in some sense, like, there are certain things you can prove trivially uh, for density matrices, uh, and then you have to go through a much more complicated procedure to prove it uh, more generally. Uh, and I, I don't really have a, an understanding or you know, when it fails or when it doesn't fail. Um, so, um, okay. So, but what is this operation in terms of this geometric picture uh, for the Rindler wedge? It's just a boost, right? So that's totally obvious. Take an operator like that and we boost it and it's obvious that it, it takes the wedge to itself, right? It doesn't bring you outside of the wedge with that operation. Um, so it leaves the wedge fixed. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this is. When did I start? When it's a good point. Yeah, it's a good point. So, yeah. Let's take a break.